Hey, this is Mike Matthews with MultipleForLife.com, and in this podcast, I want to talk about how things change once your newbie gains are behind you. Um, this is usually, I'd say, after your a somewhere between six and eight, maybe ten months of uh, in, into your weightlifting, how things change and the problems that people run into and the mistakes they make that uh, ultimately severely hinder their gains and, in many cases, just lead to them quitting. And also want to talk about uh, a subject I just wrote an article on, which is kind of a, it's how to, it's on the subject of work-life balance. And uh, I want to talk about it on the podcast, even though I just wrote an article on it because I told somebody that I would talk about it on the podcast and I decided to write an article as well. All right, so first let's start with this subject of what, how things change when you become an intermediate weightlifter. Um, And by that I mean that your newbie gains are behind you. Newbie gains are are actually a real thing. Um, I can check my PubMed. I think I saved a study on this. If not, um, just know that they're real. Meaning that for your first, minimally for your first three to six months, if you're following a program that is set up even just at at all correctly, you're going to make really good gains. You're going to make the type of gains that you would see um, that it, you know, an experienced weightlifter would we would need would need steroids to actually make gains. Uh, your first year of weightlifting, if you do it right, you can gain about 20 to 25 pounds of muscle, um, and naturally, of course. And I'll link an article down below that I wrote on this, so you can get a bit more information on this and kind of how it goes. <clears throat> but then from there, so that's year one, 20 25 pounds of muscle. That's on the high end. If you gain, I'd say. Anywhere between 15 and 20 is a very solid first year. Um, and that's enough to, to change how your physique looks, of course. Uh, that's noticeable, but it's not... You're, to take a normal guy and add 15, 20 pounds of muscle on him, that's not normal guy to, you know, oh, whoa, that, that dude looks amazing. Uh, that probably takes closer to 30 or 40 pounds of muscle and low body fat percentage added to, you know, a normal frame. Um, but in that, in that first year, you're looking at, okay, 15 to 20, your second year is about half that your third year is about half that. And from there on out, you're looking at maybe three to five pounds uh, a year of lean mass. And depending on your genetics, it could be on the lower end of that. Um, like for me in the last year, I've gained somewhere between three and four pounds of muscle. And, um, that's, that's working hard at it. That's, you know, weightlifting five to six times per week. I'm basically always 100% on my diet, meaning that I'm always, I'm never just being random with my diet. I'm either, you know, in a slight surplus or I'm in a, in a deficit if I'm going to be losing fat or I'm juggling a surplus and a deficit, which I talk uh, a bit about in my new book, which just came out called Beyond Bigger, Leaner, Stronger, which is written for advanced weightlifters and is really a sequel to Bigger, Leaner, Stronger and goes over basically what's next uh you know bigger than stronger gives you the foundation it gives you all the basic principles that you need to that you need to have uh to know how to diet and, and train correctly but and this is kind of also relevant to this podcast um <clears throat> once you've gained your first 20 25 pounds of muscle things get harder and there are new training uh methodologies that you need to know about and new training techniques that you may want to incorporate in your routine such as periodization which i talk about in the book and then also with your diet your diet uh dieting doesn't change that much um in terms of of course you still use a surplus to build muscle and still use a deficit to lose fat but there comes a point where you kind of get generally happy with your body composition and staying lean becomes more important to you. So how do you then stay lean? How do you stay, you know, 10% body fat or under and still make gains in the gym? Cause normally that means, you know, to make good gains in the gym where you feel like you're progressing that generally requires a calorie surplus, which also puts on body fat. So those are some of the things I talk about in the book. And there's a lot, a lot, a lot of other things. Um, it's a, it's a real sequel to bigger, leaner, stronger. It's not, rehashed or it's not a second edition of bigger leaner stronger which i'm almost done with actually I, that's going to be next um that'll be releasing by the end of the year um so anyways getting back on topic here so mistakes let's talk about what i see i've seen it in friends i've seen it just in you know people in the gym you know a lot of people that i that i email with and talk with so that first year is behind you even if let's say you're following a good program like like my bigger leaner stronger program or maybe starting strengths or strong lifts or whatever something that has you doing a lot of you know heavy compound weightlifting you build a, a good amount of strength you build a good amount of muscle in that first year and uh 
then the newbie gains are finally gone. And the, the, this is where it actually gets tricky because in the beginning, it all feels so easy. You're just eating food, you're lifting weights, you're enjoying yourself. Every week, it seems like your reps or, or weight is going up. You know, you might start squatting 135 or less and by the end of your first year, you're squatting 280, 290 for reps. And you're thinking like, <laughs> this is, you know, this is magic. And then all of a sudden, you're not gaining, you're not adding reps anymore, you're not adding weight anymore, your body is not visually changing, your weight is, is sticking. Um, why? So one of the big uh, you know, problems that people run into, one of the big mistakes they make is they start getting really, uh, they just start sucking on their diet. And the most common mistakes that people make is, see, when you're new to weightlifting, if you at least understand the basic principles of energy balance and have you know some sort of awareness of macronutrient uh, balancing in terms of like high protein, moderate to high carb, moderate to low fat, and you just kind of stick to that, but you're not exact in your numbers, and some days are high and some days are low, the fact that you're new to weightlifting still just allows you to make gains. Um, you know, it's it that's that's just that's just the way it is, but. As you become an intermediate weightlifter and, you, and the newbie gains are behind you, getting tight on your diet becomes very, very important. All right, I just moved the microphone here to put it, I think, what's going to be in a better position because uh, I just remembered a few people had said that the, the volume was a bit low for them, so it should be better. Anyways, so what you do with your diet becomes very, very important once the newbie gains are behind you. And the, the most common mistake that people make is they bulk incorrectly by eating way too much food, gaining fat way too quickly, um, you know, not allowing themselves to much time to actually build muscle. Like maybe their bulk lasts two months or three months max, and they've put on so much body fat that now they have to cut. Because once you start getting over 15, 16% body fat, you're gonna find it harder to build muscle just because of insulin sensitivity reasons. That one of the main reasons is that your insulin sensitivity just gets worse and worse as you get fatter, and that gets in the way of muscle growth. So really the ideal range that you're looking to uh, fluctuate in when you're building your body is, you know, if you're a guy is about 10 to 15% body fat. If you're a girl, probably about 20 to 25%. So, um, you know, those, are, those numbers can be fudged up or down a couple percent, but that's the range that you're looking at. So the most common mistake is bulk, you know, by eating obscene amounts of food and cheat meals, you know, massive cheat meals, gain fat way too quickly, um, and then have to cut. And then the next mistake is then cutting for too long by not being aggressive enough with your calorie deficit and cheating too much on your diet. Um, and, you know, making what should be a two month cut or even a shorter into, you know, double that, turning it into a four month cut or five month cut. Um, I'm going to link an article below that I wrote rec recently on why I think rapid weight loss is better uh, than slow cutting if you do it correctly, you know, so as to not lose uh, muscle or lose very little muscle and, you know, maintain your strength in the gym. Um, but so you have, you have too short of a bulk, which when you're in a calorie surplus, that's when your body's primed to build muscle, but you only, you know, keep it in a surplus for a couple months because you're in a massive surplus, gain too much fat. Then now you flip to a calorie deficit, which impairs muscle growth. And when you're, you can build muscle and lose fat simultaneously, but you can only really do it if you're new. If you're not new to weightlifting uh, or proper weightlifting, then you, and you're not on drugs, you're not going to be building muscle and losing fat. If you're new to weightlifting or if you are new to correct weightlifting and for a natural weightlifter, that means emphasizing heavy compound weightlifting. If you've been doing, let's say, shitty isolation bodybuilding type routines for a long time, high rep stuff, supersets, drop sets, a lot of isolation machines and whatever, and then you switch to a heavy compound type program that has you heavy squatting, heavy deadlifting, bench press, military press, you can make, I wouldn't say you're going to get full newbie gains, but you can experience a bit of the newbie gains and you can experience a bit of the recomp where you can build muscle and lose fat simultaneously. <clears throat> but if you're like me, I've been weightlifting correctly for about five years now, give or take. And at this point, there's just no way. There's no way that I can build muscle and lose fat simultaneously. When I'm losing fat, I'm just looking to maintain my, my strength and maintain my muscle, really. Um, so you have now these, these short bulks and these long cuts that just you know, should, should be done much faster. And what that, what that really comes out to is like over a six-month period, let's say you were in a surplus for uh, two months during your bulk, and let's say you gained 
um, four pounds of muscle, too much fat, but four pounds of muscle. And then you cut now for four or five months, slow cutting, and gained really no muscle. Let's say you didn't lose any muscle, which many people do lose muscle when they cut because they do it incorrectly. But let's say you just did it correctly. You didn't lose the muscle. But now, you know, over the course of uh, that six, seven months, you've only gained four pounds of muscle, um, which is just not very good. Like say that, that's, that, let's say that's year two. You can gain upwards of double that if you're, if you're doing it right. So that's one of the big mistakes that people run into is they, they, <clears throat> they don't, uh, they, they, they get laxer on their diet for some reason as opposed to getting tighter with it and maybe that's because you know for that first year it is kind of like a wild ride where your body's changing every week and you kind of just get you know you think maybe you can get away with anything kind of thing um, another mistake that people make with diet is they kind of get lazy on their on their intake meaning that they don't they're not following a meal plan or they're not tracking their intake on a daily basis and they don't realize that they're dramatically under eating or overeating or they get very like some days are very low calorie some days are very high calorie some days are somewhere in the middle and that can just mess with uh, mess with your progress I haven't seen any real research on this but I've experienced it and seen it in others where when you when you're bulking you have things going correctly and you're in a slight surplus and you're and you're not going crazy with cheat meals yes you get a little bit fatter over time uh, that is just the way it is but you kind of get into a, a, a groove where every week you know you start making gaining a rep on your big lifts and then after a few weeks you're able to add five pounds and you know move up and move up and move up um, but to, to reach that you have and again, this is just kind of anecdotal. I don't really have any specific evidence I've seen of this other than it's just I've experienced it with myself and a lot of people I've worked with is that you have to be consistent with your diet and you have to have your diet set up correctly and you have to hit your numbers consistently. Um, this is especially true of people like, you know, that have an uh, ectomorphic type of body like my brother-in-law who what he used to do is he's very ecto. Um, he would like gain a, a pound or so in, in, a, in a week when he'd be bulking. Then on the weekends, his diet would go to shit. He'd eat nothing. He'd eat no protein. I don't, I don't even know why. He just didn't eat over the weekends. He would lose about a pound over the weekends and just rinse, repeat. And he was doing that for months. And I was like, what are you doing, dude? Eat food on the weekends. Your body needs it. You need to be eating a lot. So when he finally did, he started then actually gaining size and holding on to it. So uh, I've seen that happen with other people where, yeah, that for him it was the weekends, but for other people it's just random days. One day intake's way, way low, another day intake is high, and that just messes with you. Also, like if you're messing with your carbs too much, if your carbs you know, are very low for a couple days and then, they, then they're moving back up to a normal range, that affects your training immediately. I mean, one or two, to, two days of low carb uh, is enough to drain your glycogen stores enough, especially if you're exercising and you're not replenishing that. Uh, to severely impact your training. I mean, you can, you could, you could carb up. You could eat an extra hundred grams of carbs today over your normal amount and probably gain twenty pounds on your on your lifts tomorrow. Like if you, you know, whatever that first big compound lift is that you're going to be doing, if you're squatting, deadlifting, whatever. Uh, if you eat enough carbs the day before that you can gain easily 10 pounds right away. I've had as much as a 30 pound gain just overnight, just from eating carbs. That's the power of glycogen. Um, so yes, that's the other mistake is just being too random with diet, not tracking intake properly. Um, moving on to the next mistake is something that Martin Burkan from, you know, lean gains, he talked about called fuck around itis. And basically that is where people, they get, they start to get fancy when, once the newbie gains are behind them and things start slowing down and they get almost like panicky, like, oh, it's not so easy anymore. I don't want to work hard for this. So then the solution is start trying weird programs. I mean, there are a million weird programs out there that promise everything, you know, just go, go troll through ClickBank and you could spend a thousand dollars on, on bizarre programs that are not really going to do much for you. Um, and that, that applies really to diet and exercise where people then will turn to uh, stuff like, like intermittent fasting or carb cycling or carb backloading or whatever. And none of those um, dietary methods are bad, but they're not gonna, they're not the secret to making gains. They're not like, oh, that's what you, that's what you now have to do to make gains. You could never get fancy with your training or dieting ever, and, which I actually never have. Like I've done uh, all of the, th I've done IF and, and, and carb backloading and carb cycling just to try them. And yes, like they're not bad. You're not going to ruin your physique. You can still make gains. But I don't like eating on those types of schedules. I just don't like it. And there was no benefit to it. So why bother with it? I like 
eating every few hours. Um, I like eating different types of foods. Uh, I like, you know, eating a, heart, a high carbohydrate diet. Low carb dieting sucks. Um, I'll link an article down below where I talk about why. And that's just the way that I like to eat. And that's the way that the majority of people I speak with like to eat as well. Uh, some people do prefer IF where, you know, you're fasting for, let's say, 18 hours out of 24 hours or sorry, 16 hours out of 24 hours is fasting and eight hours eating. Some people like that. Um, I'm not that big of a fan of it. I don't mind it on the weekends uh, where, you know, in the mornings, like Saturday or Sunday morning, I'm usually doing something physical. I'm usually golfing or I'm out like playing with my son or walking or something like that. So I'll, a lot of times I'll wake up and just have some leucine and maybe some caffeine and then fast through the morning, do some exercise type stuff and start eating, you know, at lunch. I don't mind that, but I wouldn't like to do it every day. Um, so that's on the dietary side of kind of get fuck around at us where people just get way too fancy with diet and they ignore the, the simple fundamentals of energy balance, macronutrient balance. That, that's really all it comes down to. Calories, how many calories are you eating versus how many calories are you burning? How are you manipulating your calories up or down depending on what you want to do with your body? Um, and how are you breaking those into macronutrients? You should always be on a high protein diet about, so, you know, depending on how many calories you're eating, it, the percentage is going to go anywhere from, it could be anywhere from 30 to 50%, depending on how many calories you're eating. But generally speaking, like if you're bulking, you're going to want to be around 0.8 to 1 uh, gram of protein per pound of body weight. And if you're cutting, I recommend a bit higher, 1 to 1.2 grams uh, per pound. Um, and then high carb dieting, I am a big proponent of it. Um, again, you'll find an article down below where I explain why, uh, but it is just better, period. There's just no arguing. Unless there's something severely wrong with your body where it can't deal with carbohydrates well, if you're exercising regularly, and especially if you're weightlifting regularly, you're going to do better on a high carb diet, I guarantee it. And your body does not need nearly as much fat as some people say it does to uh, to do everything it needs to do and to keep hormones in a healthy range. Um, so on the training side, fuck around itis is program hopping, you know, trying, there are a million different programs out there, but jumping from program to program, looking for that quick fix, looking for that newbie gain again, and it'll never come. It doesn't matter unless you get on steroids, which I don't recommend you do. You will never have newbie gains again. Just know that, that your second year, if you can gain 15 pounds of muscle in your second year, you've done really, really well. If you could gain 10, if you gain 10 pounds, that's decent. Um, based on the people that I work with, and it's probably 12 to 15 pounds is probably a good year too. That seems to be a good range of people that don't mess around with their training. They stick to the plan. They, they stick to their diet. They do everything that they're supposed to do. 12 to 15 pounds of muscle in the, in the second year um, is is probably the average. And that's with any program, the best design program, that's the best you're gonna do. So any program that can deliver that is as good as any other in my opinion. And that's where I think a lot of the, a better way to look at programs is more just on the results that they get with people. And if you see a program that's putting 15 to 20 pounds of muscle on on guys, and this is, I'm speaking for guys, girls, these numbers are cut, in, cut them in half and those are the numbers for girls. Um, if you see that, a program that's that, that guys are consistently gaining, let's say 15 to 20 pounds of muscle year one and somewhere between, I don't know, I guess it depends on who you listen to, but somewhere between 10 and 20 pounds in year two, that program is a very good program. I mean, it's you can't get more out of it. Unless you're gonna get on drugs, you can't get more out of your training. Uh, so program hopping is is bad because a lot of programs are bad so you're gonna have wasted time let's say you two months some stupid program that's a bunch of high rep stuff and not enough it's just not programmed well and frequency is not programmed correctly intensity volume blah 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 and you gain you know a pound of muscle or, or less than that in those two months and then you go to okay that was not optimal then you go to the next program go to the next program so there's that and then there's also that it's hard to really know if you're progressing because the key to it all is progressive overload the key to everything when you're a natural weightlifter is that over time you're increasing the weight on the bar you are putting your muscles under heavier and heavier loads over time that's the key to building a big strong physique um, when it comes to maintaining it you can get a bit fancier but building it is the hard work and you just can't get around it uh, so 
if you are jumping from program to program, you don't necessarily know, let's say in the programs are, are programmed very differently where you know, you're squatting one way on one program, one rep range, and you're doing it a different way on another program, different rep range. Program one has you squatting once a week, program two has you squatting three times a week and so forth. It's hard to really know where your squat is at unless you're just gonna do one rep, you know, one RM calculations. Um, but still, it's much, uh, more, it's much more helpful to be able to see over the last you know, four months, let's say four months ago, you were squatting once a week or twice a week or whatever. And, you know, you were doing, um, you know, 250 for sets of four to five reps. Now you're doing sets of 275 for four to five reps on the same protocol. That now you know, you can look at that and go, cool, I'm making progress, that's good. When you program hop, you just don't know. Because a lot of cases, the programs, I mean, the big thing in this space, as you've probably seen, is to make things very fancy sounding and make things, you know, oh, it's the latest science and it beats everything and this is how all the Hollywood actors do it and all the bodybuilders. No, the Hollywood actors and bodybuilders just blast themselves full of drugs and pound weights. Yes, that... <laughs> You just if you add all the drugs, then okay, fine. But uh, if you don't have all the drugs, it's very different. Um, another another big mistake I see is just not pushing hard in the gym. Like it probably does come down to realizing like this is going to be hard. This once the newbie gains are behind you, uh, if you really want to have the type of physique that uh, impresses people, where you kind of look like a fitness model, you're looking at from from day one probably three to four years of hard work. Uh, and by hard work, I mean that every day, I mean, you don't have to be in the gym long, long periods of time. You could spend, I only work out um, five hours. I lift weights about five hours a week and I do two to three cardio sessions that are about 20 minutes long a week. That's it. Uh, and if I needed to cut that down to three, you know, weightlifting three times a week, I could and I still look the same. I just, I kind of like lifting. So I, and I'm still trying to, you know, improve my physique in small little ways. So I go five days a week. Um, but it takes, you know, that type of hard work where you're five days a week, you're, you know, in there consistently to make small gains. It's a lot of effort that you have to expend for what feels like relatively small gains and small changes. It really is. Uh, you know, you can bust your ass, let's say it's year three and you busted your ass for six months and, you know, heavy weightlifting is tough. It takes, it takes uh, a lot of effort. And let's say you've gained, I don't know, three or four pounds or so in six months. You don't see that very much on your body. I mean, you will see it, but it's not like a dramatic three or four, you had three or four pounds, maybe five pounds of muscle in that time period. It's not like, oh my God, look at that. But, you know, how much did you have to work for that? And then on the dietary side, you know, how, uh, again, you, if you're familiar with my work, you know that I'm all about flexible dieting, eating foods you like, and, you know, sticking to nutritious foods, but don't, don't get, uh, don't, don't fall too much into the traps of thinking that certain carbs are going to make you fat or, you know, that carbs in general are bad or that you should never have any sugar or anything like that. Um, hit your numbers, eat nutritious foods and work in some stuff that you like and you'll be fine. But you still have to know what you're eating. It's not the normal, you know, the normal person out there just goes, I'm hungry. What am I going to eat? What do I feel like? Good. Let's do that. Like that's how, you know, you can't do that. Uh, really, I guess you can play with it a little bit. If you kind of know foods inherently, if you like, I have a pretty good sense of foods. So if I go to a restaurant, you know, it's hard in the, unless the restaurant has some very simple, like if I go to a, a steakhouse, I can order a steak. That's pretty simple. I, you know, I can even look that up on my phone. There's not going to be that much uh, variance there or fish or the proteins, as long as they don't have sauces and things like that. But if I'm going to go like appetizer side, blah, 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 eat some bread and stuff, it's just, there's a point where it's like, who knows? I ate a lot of calories. That's what I did. Um, so all in all, it just takes a lot of Consistency and takes quite a bit of discipline to uh, as as you continue, and you have to know that the gains the the progress slows down. So you may even feel like you're working harder and harder because you're lifting heavier and heavier weights. And uh, as you as you become a more advanced weightlifter, your workouts become even a little bit more intense than when they when you were a newbie. Like in my in the in the bigger uh, beyond bigger leaner stronger program in my latest book. It's a periodized version of the Bigger, Leaner, Stronger program. The workouts are only one set more, but you're doing some really heavy weightlifting in it, and they're hard. They're just hard workouts. They're, they're effective, and they work very well, but 
it's tougher. Like the BBLS workouts are tougher than the BLS workouts. There's no question. Um, so, you know, you work harder, you get less. That's kind of like, it, it's, it, it has a, almost like it's an unfair, it's like a paradoxical in other areas of your life. If you work harder, you're generally going to get more. That's not how working out is. You work harder, you get less, but you still get something. And that's the key. All right. Well, that's all I wanted to talk about. That's really all I wanted to say on, on, you know, these points of, uh, the big mistakes that intermediate weightlifters make. If you can just consistently be, uh, you know, be consistent with your diet, um, you know, stick to your numbers. Don't get too crazy with things. Uh, eat the way that you like to eat. And if you can stick to a program that's good and you can make gains on it, if you can, you know, focus on your compound weightlifting and, and see that your strength goes up there. And uh, if you push yourself hard in your workouts and really try to, you know, just try to get one more rep than last week, that's a successful workout. If you do that, uh, you know, and stay patient you will make good progress and you will make good gains and you will be able to reach your goal. Um, you know, I, I'm at this point pretty happy with where my body's at. I feel like I've kind of reached my, this is genetically speaking, probably my peak really anyway. I don't know how much more muscle I can really add. Um, maybe I could put on another five pounds over the next few years, but I don't even care because I'm pretty happy with how I look and I kind of just want to stay like this. It just took a while to get here. Um, in my case, I, it took way longer than it should have because for my first seven, almost yeah, seven years of weightlifting, I just didn't really even know what I was doing and I made terrible gains. But looking back, if I would have started knowing what I know now, I probably would have been able to go from beginning to now in five or six years probably, no, no, no less than four. So let's say somewhere between four and six years, I would look more or less the way that I look now and then would just kind of do what I'm doing now, which is I maintain, I get to eat, you know, plenty of food. I get to train uh, heavy the way I like to and, and maintain the type of body that I like. So you can get there. You just, you know, it, it takes uh, quite a bit more work than a lot of people think. All right. So now I just want to move on to this other subject, which is the work life balance thing. Cause I, um, I'm asked that fairly often just with kind of all the things that I have going uh, at muscle for life and with Legion and, you know, other various work things that I'm involved in that I don't really even talk about because they're not really related to those things. Like how do I kind of keep uh, all the plates spinning? And, and the answer, I mean, it's pretty simple. One is I, I have a great team of friends. We all work hard. Um, you know, they do a lot to keep the show going. So it's not just me, but uh, also, I mean, I work a lot of hours. There's just no way around it. Uh, you know, my average weeks are probably 65 to 75 hours and sometimes it can be you know 80 hours plus depending on what's going on and you know i i follow um some blogs that i guess i guess they're, they're, they're kind of just intellectual blogs i guess kind of highbrow book reviews and um quotes from famous people and uh things like that and i've seen over the course of the last year or so it's been kind of trendy to um basically just kind of poo poo what would be considered like workaholism and that you know this idea that as a culture we're too work obsessed and that work doesn't really matter it's not that meaningful etc cetera, etc cetera. and you know while those ideas inherently I, they don't really resonate with me um I'll, you, i mean I, I'll, I'll take i'll entertain them and kind of think well you know try to look at myself and go, well, why, why do I work so much? Is, am I just addicted to this idea of being busy? Uh, because it just gives me something to do. Is it, you know, that I have some, you know, big problem in my life that I am avoiding by just working a lot? Uh, does it make me kind of feel important? And for me, uh, I mean, self-awareness can be tough. I mean, obviously how we perceive ourselves in many ways is not, uh, the objective reality and definitely how others perceive us. Uh, but I don't really think it's any of those things, at least like in an extreme sense with me. Um, I don't, I don't like being busy just to feel like I'm busy. I don't, I'm never one to seek, you know, real praise or importance or whatever. I don't, I don't care. I rarely ever even talk about my work unless people really ask about it. And I can enjoy time away from work, doing other things, um, you know, for a certain period of time. Vacations for me get pretty old at about seven to 10 days or so is when I'm really just, I, it would have to be the most thrilling experience of my life to, to keep, keep my attention at that point where I just want to get back to doing something, uh, you know, work related. But so what it, what it kind of comes down for me and the best way I can express it is I just like to, I just like to make 
stuff. I like to make stuff happen. And I like to create things. I like to come up with ideas and see them working in my mind in a certain way, putting them into reality and having that work. Not because it confirms my, you know, uh, value as a person or because it's somehow tied into my ego or something like that. It's just fun to me. Like that is a fun experience. Some people have fun playing video games. Uh, some people have fun watching TV shows. I have fun doing that. I have fun coming up with ideas and then working on them until they are, you know, come to fruition and seeing them work. It's just fun. It could be, I mean, for me, that could be writing. Um, I mean, it, shit, it could be, it could be inventing. I could see how that could be fun being an inventor. You know what I mean? Just that concept is, is, is cool to me. That's also why I really like marketing because, because marketing is a creative, it's a very creative, uh, field where it's, you have to come up with ideas and there's a lot of thought that goes into these ideas and you have to really think things through and really kind of put yourself in someone else's shoes and then execute those ideas and then get them out there and see what happens. That whole process is fun to me. And for me, that's, that's really what work is. And I mean, even, even uh, how, you know, I, I, I've been taking up golf recently and how I approach that is a very, you know, like a lot of people come up to me on the driving range and I'm videoing my swing and working on things. And, you know, they'll, they, they'll question how, how am I out there? I don't have that much time to do it. So these guys are there probably all the time. So whatever, and they, they see me coming out on the weekends and I, I'm, 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 doing the same thing every weekend, working on these drills, improving things or whatever. And to them, you know, that's a grind. Like, how do you sit out here and just grind like that? And I'm from like, that doesn't feel like a grind. Like I'm having fun. I am, I know exactly what I'm working toward and I know this is going to get me there. And that's fun. Like I have an idea in my mind of how I want my swing to be, uh, so I can be a good player and I'm just doing what it takes to get there. And every week I get a little bit closer, a little bit closer. So how is that not fun? Like, what are you, what are you talking about? How, what, how is it fun for you to sit out here and just hit balls over and over and over for hours that I see these guys every week with terrible swings? They're never, ever going to be good. That's not fun. So that's why I like to work a lot. But what about this point of work life balance? You know, people ask like, how do I fit in time for, for social things? How do I, you know, hang out with friends and watch TV shows and, you know, my playtime and whatever. And the answer is obvious. Like I work a lot more than I do any of that stuff. And again, it comes back to, because for me, work is a lot more enjoyable than watching a TV show. A TV show has to be really, really good for me to want to watch it. Uh, the TV shows that I review and recommend on my cool stuff is uh, I'll, I'll watch them during my cardio. That's like if I'm doing cardio, I'm usually watching a TV show or I'm reading a book or listening to an audio book. And sometimes uh, if I'm watching a show that's particularly good, maybe I'll sneak in an episode here, an extra episode here or there, you know, maybe on the weekend or something like that. But for the most part, TV shows are boring to me. Uh, and a lot of things is the experience is not as exciting as, as, you know, working on something else, uh, working on this workout app that I'm, you know, working on. That's fun to me doing all the sketching and putting it all together. That, that, that's just a fun activity. Some people might have fun. Someone else might think that walking their dog is fun. Like I don't mind walking my dog, but I wouldn't say that that's particularly fun. So I don't, my, my work life balance is just very different than other people's. Uh, you know, I work a lot more than I play and I don't need very much play time to kind of recharge my batteries. Um, you know, a lot of people I talk about, well, then I get asked, how do I not burn out if I'm, you know, averaging, you know, maybe 12 hours a day on the weekdays, sometimes a little bit more. And then I work on Sundays as well. I take Saturdays off. How am I, how am I not burned out by now? Cause I've been doing that for years. Um, and I've never come, I don't even know, I've never come close to burnout. I don't even know what that, it, what that would be like. Um, and honestly, the, the people that I've known personally that would talk about balance and avoiding burnout and all that were just lazy. I mean, that's really, it was just an excuse to, to, to be lazy, really. You know, I think about like, and I've even said this to some of these people, like, could you imagine what would you do if we went back a couple hundred years and you had to you know, work with your hands 10 hours a day on the farm just to have food to feed yourself. And I really think some of these people would probably just starve to death. They would just go, this is too much work. It's not worth it. Or they would just become beggars or something and probably starve to death. 
And yeah, that might seem a bit harsh, but I mean, some people, I don't know, I, I, it's, I have a hard time taking their, seeing the world through their eyes because in, in my opinion, whatever you say is too much, whatever you think is too much is going to be too much. If you think that, you know, working any more than 40 hours a week, which is more than the American, the average, Ameri average American works about, I think it was like 34 hours a week or something like that. So if you think doing more than that or more than 40 hours a week is just too much, you know, then it's going to be too much. If you want kind of a, an excuse to underachieve, then just decide that you're exhausted. Every day by blah, you're exhausted. And I understand there can be some physical aspect to that. You know, if you don't take care of your body, you probably will be exhausted, uh, you know, a bit more frequently. I mean, I, I'm rarely ever do I feel exhausted. Maybe if I somehow, if my son keeps me up and I don't sleep more than three hours a night for four days in a row, maybe I'll be exhausted. Otherwise, I'm never exhausted. But uh, if, if you have body issues, I understand, but the average person doesn't have severe enough body issues to cause exhaustion. This is just, it, it's mental, uh, really. We're talking about, uh, you know, what, there's, there's a, we're talking about uh, what Napoleon, there's a quote from Napoleon where he said that sometimes death only comes from lack of energy. I mean, really, if, if some of these people, they have no challenge in their life. So of course, they're not energetic about anything. There's no, they, of course, they sleep 10 hours a night because they have no reason to wake up. Why? What, what's their, what's the point? Uh, might as well sleep as much as possible, right? On the other hand, if I think really just about anybody, if they decided that working 80 hours a week on projects that they actually wanted to work on. I can understand if you're in a job that you really don't like and you you hate your work and whatever, you don't like doing it, that's one thing. But freely chosen, things, any sort of activities that have some sort of purpose, you're going for something. If you decided that you could work 80 hours a week on that and be excited to do it, uh, I think you could do it. Um, it's just, you know, there are people get ideas from a lot of different places and then they decide that that's how it is for them. And, you know, many people are concerned with what other people think and concerned about what other people say. Um, and I have always been almost to a fault, I guess, uh, very, I, I wouldn't say stubborn, but skeptical of other people's advice and skeptical of just other people, how they live their lives, and really looking at, you know, if a person is going to give me any advice on anything, do I really, would I really listen to this person? Like, are they really living the type of life that I want to live? If not, and they're trying to advise me on something that is related to that, then I'm just going to ignore them. And, you know, I've probably missed out on some good advice operating that way, but I've also missed out on a lot of bad advice or I've skipped over a lot of bad advice that would have definitely gotten in my way. So I think in the end, the real thing about work-life balance is you have to find what works for you. You have to balance your ambitions with your actions. Uh, if you're like me and you just really like making stuff happen and doing cool things and you don't do enough of it, then your life is going to feel out of balance. Uh, yeah, you know, I think their idleness does have a value, but um, it's definitely that it's a matter of diminishing returns, at least for me personally. Uh, a little bit of idleness is nice every week to just kind of recharge and relax and not really have to think about anything, or whatever. I understand that. But, um, you know, I, I think it's also like a medicine. Too much of it just kind of makes you more sick than when you started. But on the other hand, if you're not really concerned with that and uh, your ambition is kind of just relax and luxuriate, uh, then, you know, I think you should do that. I don't think that you should feel compelled to, to be busy every moment or to tell everyone that you're always busy or have to pretend like you're busy. Um, I don't think you have to feel guilty for not working all the time. Uh, you know, I think everyone should provide for themselves and provide for their families. Uh, but if beyond that, if you'd rather spend your time with loved ones or, you know, just kind of playing, doing whatever, then, you know, do that. I'd say be resolute in your idolist. Do it, do it, uh, do it well. But I, I do think that, um, I mean, it's just kind of a last little note, just kind of random thought on the matter is that with uh, some of these blogs that I follow, it's almost like like I said, it's kind of trendy almost to criticize people that at work a lot or look down on them, which, I mean, that I, in some cases is probably just a matter of jealousy. People disparage what they don't understand or what they don't have, right? So if somebody, uh, and this has, of course, been statistically speaking, the highest wage earners are also the hardest workers. They also work the most. Um, and regardless of what anyone says in terms of, you know, how quote unquote wealthy they are with friends and you know, family and stuff like that. 
Uh, life with money is way better than life without money. Uh, I've, I've had, you know, a lot of debt in the past and not had any money to spend. And I've had now no debt with, you know, uh, an, an, enough income to live the way I want to live. And I will take money over no money any day. Um, so people see that, not with me, but just people see, you know, some, some people, they look to people that have made money and see, you know, maybe it's a jealousy thing or whatever, and they get mad about it and then criticize them. Oh, well, that person's just a workaholic or their marriage is going to fall apart or whatever. Um, so I would say, don't become one of those people. <laughs> don't, don't get overly cynical about it. But, um, you know, also if I don't think you have to feel bad if you're not one of those kind of, you know, workaholic type people if you're not like if you don't view things the way that i do uh i don't think any i don't think I, i'm even universally right in it um that's just the way that i like to live my life and that's just my life my work-life balance but i think you have to find the same so that's all for this podcast i know it ran on a little bit longer sorry about that i'll try to keep them you know to the to the 30 30 40 minute range max um i hope you enjoyed it and if you haven't checked out my new book yet uh, if you head over to muscleforlife.com, you'll see ads for it all over the place. I mean, not obnoxiously, but you'll see it like in the hello bar at the top and on the side and stuff. Um, I think that you will really like it if you are an intermediate weightlifter or an advanced weightlifter, or even if you're a new weightlifter, the program, you might not be ready for the program yet. Uh, and I explain who the program's for really in there and in, in different benchmarks that you should meet. But, uh, I think that you will get a lot out of it, especially all the, all the, uh, diet stuff and there's a lot of other stuff in there, mobility stuff and other things. All right. Thanks again. See you next time.